Hi there, everybody. Um, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, my name is Kate Sorensen, and I'm here representing Oita Prefecture in Kyushu, Japan. Um, and I have quite a connection to Kyushu, and it really was the beginning of my tourism career because after high school, I uh, had a had an idea that I wanted to work in tourism. It was in the in the nineties. Uh, in the mid 90s and a lot of Japanese were, were coming to Australia at the time and so it was quite common that um, students would go over to Japan for student exchange as it probably is today and um, I was really lucky I landed in Kyushu in, in Fukuoka and spent a year in, in school there and I've had a tourism career ever since um, but full circle today I find myself um, representing the neighbouring prefecture of, of where I lived in Fukuoka and that is Oita. Um, so I'm really excited to, to share some information about this beautiful uh, destination with you and I'm just going to jump over now and, and share my presentation. Um, so I'm just going to talk a bit about some of the, um, firstly just some of the the destination and location and, and key experiences to be enjoyed in Oita. And then at the end of the presentation, I have a few example itineraries on, on how you can um, pull together an itinerary in Oita. So just firstly, starting with uh, the location. So as I mentioned, um, Oita is located down in uh, Kyushu. Uh, so you can see Honshu here. Um, actually, I'll just turn my little point on. Uh, so Honshu, the main the main island of Japan, where where you know Tokyo, Kyo, Osaka, all the big cities and so on are, and then Kyushu is that first island just below, and Oita is on the uh, northeastern uh, point of the island, uh, so right adjacent to to Fukuoka. So really easy to get down there. Um, you can fly in, of course, and there's direct flights from Tokyo, Osaka, and Nagoya. Uh, but but equally, if travellers are experiencing a train journey through Honshu, they can continue down to Fukuoka on the on the bullet train, the Shinkansen, and and from Fukuoka um, they can just get a, a standard overland train uh, into into Oita. Uh, there's also a ferry, <clears throat> so there's a ferry that comes in from uh, Kobe and Osaka. It's a similar concept to our Spirit of Australia, which connects. Uh, Victoria and Tasmania, uh, so cars can go on and so on. And that's just another another neat idea on on how you can combine Honshu with uh, with Kyushu and and plan a, an itinerary that takes in both those uh, islands. So. Um, just this is the size, this is Oita, just a little bit more of a detailed map. So you can see on the left, I'm not going to go through them, but the 18 uh, different um, regions within within Oita. Um, so a couple that you might have heard of would be Oita City. Um, and that became a little better known to Australians last year um, through the Rugby World Cup because the Wallabies played a couple of day, games down there, in, including the semi-final, which unfortunately they lost to England. Um, so that's put Oita a bit more in the awareness of of Australians when when they're planning their Japan trips, um, but Beppu is definitely another one that that Australians have heard of, and if if they've been to Japan, um, they're likely to have heard of it as well because it's really well known to the Japanese and, and a destination that that Japanese people um, often often travel to, and and that's the region that um, is is well known for its hot springs, the onsens. Um, and I'll tell you a bit about, bit more about those in a minute. So just in terms of the landscape, so it's it's a really picturesque um, destination, Oita. It's surrounded by mountains and you can see it's surrounded by the, the sea as well. Um, so it's a big part of it is, is National Park and it's the seventh biggest um, ratio of National Park in, in Japan. So it's a really, um, really uh, nature rich destination. But I wanted to point out also its self-sufficiency rating because I found this really interesting. Its self-sufficiency rating is 40% and that's the highest in Japan. And, and the reason for that um, links back to the hot springs and that geothermal water that it, that it generates is also um, generating energy for them down there. So um, so a really interesting um, place in, in terms of its landscape and, and nature. But the experience pillars that I'm going to run through today um, are, the, are the four that are identified as, as the drivers that, that would help Australians decide to include Oito in their Japan itinerary. Uh, so it's definitely around that relaxation and that onsen uh, hot springs experience. Um, the cuisine, all Japanese prefectures have a fabulous story to tell about their cuisine and, and Oito is no different. Uh, 
the culture and the history is is really um, rich down in Oita. And uh, as I've already mentioned, the, the nature, there's just an, an abundance of nature-based experiences uh, to be had. So I'll start with the, um, with the onsens, the hot springs. Um, so yeah, Oita do produce the most uh, hot spring water of anywhere in Japan and the second most to anywhere in the world. So it's second to Yellowstone National Park in, um, in America. Um, so there's a lot of onsen experiences to be having and there's a few different regions to in, enjoy them um, in as well. Um, the, the Japanese historically have always visited onsen for their own relaxation. So going way back in time, it was a place where farmers would come after, you know, hard work on the land at the end of a, of a harvesting season or something. They'd come down and, and have a week to repair the body in Oita. And that would include um, the, the hot springs, um, as well as these uh, sand and, and mud baths that you can see in the picture down here on, on the right. So this is where in a, in a um, cotton kimono, you lay down in this, in this sand and um, a lady comes and, and, and shovels this um, warm and, and heavy sand onto your body and it just removes all the, all the aches and pains. So um, that's a great experience to be had. I've noted there the tattoo friendly component because that's a really commonly asked question when, when you're going into the onsens. Um, people ask whether or not they, they can go in with tattoos and which is often the case they can't but but there are um, tattoo friendly onsens uh, down in Oita. But the other one that I just wanted to pull out is um, the Jigoku or the Hells onsens which are in um, Beppu. So these are really unique. So there's seven of these that you can tour around uh, in a day so you can hop around to, to each of the seven and each is is very unique in, in its colours and its activity in, in the way that it, um, that it bubbles and moves. And, and they're all these temperamental uh, onsens that um, back in, in time way ago, the reason they got their name Hell's Onsens was because people thought perhaps they were cursed um, because they bubble away and um, some of them spurt up water at, at a great height. They're these really rich colours like the red you see here in the middle, and the turquoise blue and, and, and the mud one at the top. So, um, so people thought they, they might be cursed and, and, and there were times when they were a bit afraid of them. But, but now they've become a really interesting um, tourist experience um, just to hop around and, and witness each of them. And they're only for viewing. Um, they're 90 degrees in temperature. So they're not the onsen that you soak in. Uh, but you'll see things like um, a basket of eggs or a basket of vegetables being cooked above the steam of the onsen because they're 90 degrees. So they're just so hot that, um, that they can do that. Uh, so that's, that's so that's something to to consider as an inclusion when um, people are visiting uh, Beppu, and there are English tours that, that people can do of the um, Jigoku onsens as well. Um, so just on the cuisine, as I mentioned, um, Oita has a has a story to tell about its cuisine, and it and it really takes advantage of the the rural landscape and um, and the resource rich um, environment that that Oita is based in. So some of their specialties are um, firstly this this one here on the left, which is the Tori Ten um, chicken, which is the tempura chicken, and that's quite unique. Like we all have tempura. Um, in Australia as well, and it's often the prawns and the vegetables. But down in Oita, they've they've got the um, the chicken version of that as well. Just down the bottom here is the Jigoku Mushi, and that's the Hell Steaming Kitchen. So this is another um, unique food offering down in Oita, and it's where they're cooking the food using that steam that comes up through. The, the geothermal waters. So um, there's things like pizzas that can be had, but vegetables, fish, anything. And because you're just steaming the food, it, it really uh, obviously brings out, you know, all the flavours and, um, and it's a really interesting way to, to enjoy a meal. Um, another one there is the bungo beef. Uh, so this has really made a name for itself within the same family as wagyu beef, and that's um, a specialty of, of Oita. Uh, their seafood is abundant because they're surrounded by the water there. Uh, so um, other specialties are blowfish, but, but their sushi's also got a bit of a reputation because um, down in Oita, they, they have a much bigger piece of fish 
in ratio to the rice. So, uh, so that's so that's another specialty that that they like to showcase when when people come in. The the others just because of the land again and and just um, how rich the land is. They're the biggest producers of dried shiitake mushroom and the only producers in Japan of of saffron. So they are producing a lot of interesting things. The um, the kabosu there is that um, citrus fruit that you that you find in a lot of Japanese cooking as well, but that's just some of the specialties. And 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 sake is another one that that they'll like to um, showcase if you if you make it down there. Um, so culture and history is is a big part of of what there is to explore when when visiting Oita. Um, so there's countless temples and, and shrines, but but Buddhism is really at the heart of of some of the experiences to be had. Um, so it really found its foothold in, in Oita around 1300 years ago. And there's a huge amount of evidence of that through the through these Buddha statues that you can see up here. And um, over 80% of all of Japan's uh, stone Buddhas uh, are found in, in Oita. Um, they have a fabulous um, calendar of events. Um, so the Hitagion Festival um, there. They have a lot of crafts to showcase as well. You can see the pottering there, but they also do all oh, the, the bamboo weaving um, is really, really special. Um, but I just wanted to point out the historical town of Hita as well, because that's often compared to as the, um, as the Kyoto of, of Kyushu. Uh, so worth a visit as well. Just moving on to, to nature now. So Oito is home to um, three national treasures. Um, so that's the, the Yusujingu Shrine, the Fukuji Temple, and the Yusu Keystone Buddhas that, that I just mentioned. Um, so Mount Yufu is, is often um, pictured, it's pictured here. So um, often a big part of the, the images that you see um, when Oita is being promoted. But um, it really just boasts these, these stunning views because you've got the, the Bungo Suido uh, channel and then, um, and then all the mountain ranges around the, island, around, um, the prefecture as well. The Harajuri Falls there on, on the right are known um, in Japan as Asians, ver Asians, sorry, in Asia actually, as Asia's version of Niagara Falls. Uh, and you can see like it's such a unique landscape there with the, with the rice paddy fields surrounding this horseshoe shaped uh, falls there. Um, was there anything else? Oh, I just wanted to point out just the hiking and, and the bike riding. So, so there's a lot of uh, tours, that can, tours that can be had, which, which really enjoy the landscape through walking tours. Um, but also uh, it's a great destination uh, for biking if, you've, if you're talking to a more active, active traveler. So I just want to talk a little bit about who and, and how, I guess, to, to, to pitch Oita and, and, and when it's good to include an itinerary. I think the great thing about Japan is that Australians are, are heading back time and time again. Um, so each time looking for perhaps a little bit of a new destination to explore. So generally they may have done the Golden Triangle, um, so seen some of the other secondary cities outside of Tokyo, Osaka and Kyoto. And, and really looking to explore a different side to, to Japan um, and looking to immerse themselves more deeply in, in, in the culture. So Oita and, and Kyushu are, are perfect for that, for that sort of um, traveller. Um, it works really well for a pre-post ski trip because the onsen experience is best had in winter. Um, so it's a great way to, to tap that on at, at the end of a of a week skiing and particularly to, to repair all those aches and pains um, for all those diehard Australian skiers. Um, it's great for nature lovers and, and active travellers, foodies and, and families alike. So, so it's, a, it's a destination you can sell with confidence because there's something to be had for all. And I'm just going to talk through um, that in a bit more detail and just share two uh, itineraries with you. So I do have um, a booklet of, of um, this is not going to come up backwards. Atio instead of Oita, but it's a booklet of uh, of itineraries and, and suggestions. So it's got lots of ideas and on all the main tourist attractions and and how they can be pieced together. But I just want to show two today, and the first one is um, what you can achieve in two days, and it's all the popular tourist attractions in, in an itinerary. So this itinerary goes to Kokonoe, uh, Yufu City, uh, Beppu City and Oita City. And these are just some of the highlights that you could experience on, 
these two so, tours. So definitely um, included, you can see there, one of the um, Jigoku onsens, the Hells onsens. Um, but you'll be able to really take in Oita's beauty and, and you visit here in um, Kokona, the um, that's suspension bridge where, where you get that um, beautiful outlook over this scenery that um, changes through the seasons. Uh, you visit Yufuin, which I know that Tony's going to talk about a little bit today. Um, so that's a really popular uh, onsen resort in Japan as well. Um, and then taking in the, the Jigoku um, onsen experience. So, so that's a, an example of a two day which really um, packs in those, those major attractions that I've talked to. And then a three day itinerary that's a little bit more focused on, on the, the Buddhism culture and, and the nature is, is this one. So this one visits Yusa City, Bungo, Takara City and Kunisaki. Uh, and the highlights of, of this tour are more around uh, the, the temples and, and the cultural experiences. So the Yusa Jingu Shrine, um, you, you'll be able to visit and really rejuvenate the soul there. Um, enjoy some of the uh, history of Oita and, and Japan and and um, there's an element of, of trekking in this one. Um, and then see those, those Buddha statues as well. So the stone statues that, that I mentioned. Um, so do keep away to in mind when, when people are looking for a different side of Japan. Of, of course, um, when you come down to Kyushu, you can explore further than Oita. Um, you can also combine Okinawa and, and, and create a really uh, interesting itinerary of the southern islands of, of Japan. So it's really uh, endless in, in how you can plug this into to a Japan itinerary. But I'm Sydney based, so I'm putting my details up there now for, for you to jot down and I'd love to hear from you. Uh, as I said, I've got a, a range of brochures and, and maps that, that I can share and um, a couple of websites there to, to just um, find some more information as well. So thanks again, Tony and JNTO, and um, I hope to hear from you all soon. Thanks so much.